When Manihashi's citizenship was revoked, he was being punished for refusing to act as an informer for MI5. This is the tip of a very big iceberg. The special branch and MI5 have been blackmailing people in this country for several decades, especially Irish people during the conflict in Northern Ireland in the 70s and 80s, and then later, Kurdish and Tamil refugees. This practice became known to immigration lawyers who were dealing with their cases. This evening we've heard several examples. For example, the Kurdish activist who was arrested for supposedly raising funds for the PKK, who in fact had been raising funds for a Europe-wide campaign to advocate Kurdish language rights in Turkey. After he was arrested, he was uh, asked by MI5 to provide information on Kurdish political activities in this country. MI5 hinted that such cooperation would help his case for political asylum. And this is typical of many other cases of people who are obviously vulnerable. They have no secure status in this country. When we held a meeting in 2009, on the same topic, MI5 blackmail, Francis Weber, an immigration lawyer, told us, this is one of many examples, a young man brought up in this country who moved to Syria in 2007 and was tortured there. He was then deported back to the UK. He went home after being interrogated at the court. In his first month back in the UK, he was approached by MI5 and was told to report about people in the mosque where he was going to pray, report on their views to MI5. He refused. Within a few weeks later, he was put under a control order and was forced to move 100 kilometers out of London and stay indoors for 14 hours a day as a condition of his control order. MI5 said to him, this is what happens to you if you don't cooperate with us. You see how these supposedly counter-terror measures are used as yet another weapon to force people to become informers. This practice, which was widespread among refugees, has been extended more recently to UK citizens, as in the case of the Somali youth workers at the Kentish Town Community Organization. As a crucial difference, they feel more secure as UK citizens rather than refugees, and so they've been more willing to go public and expose the practice in their own names, telling their own stories, as happened in 2009. That's why we held the first ever public meeting on this topic back then in Camden Town Hall. However, even if they're UK citizens, they've been reluctant to go public for these two reasons. First, they fear even worse persecution if they go public. And second, they fear that their own community may see them as informers, even though they're trying to do the opposite. They're trying to protest against MI5 blackmail for people to become informers. And we can even see that in the Canada New Journal, when it helpfully exposed the practice of MI5 blackmail, in the case of Mani Hashi, of course, the family rightly denied the accusation of the Home Office that he was involved in Islamist terrorism. They also felt compelled to deny that he was an informer. So you see how this perverse logic works, which uh, deters people from going public. Now, why is this blackmail happening in, in such a wide scale? It really is an extension of a much wider agenda whereby entire migrant and Muslim communities are treated as suspect communities, suspected of some association with so-called terrorism. Terrorism being defined very broadly in law to include simply verbal support for violent resistance to oppressive regimes anywhere in the world. 
One example of this overall counter-terror agenda is the Prevent Strategy, short for Prevent Violent Extremism, which defines extremist ideology very broadly. In the mindset of the securocrats, any dissent from UK foreign policy becomes an indicator of at least sympathies with terrorism, and perhaps even association. So the UK's foreign activities, which are basically plunder, counterinsurgency, and state terrorism, support for state terrorism, friendly regimes, generate enormous dissent, which is then interpreted as suspicion or association with terrorism in this country. So there is systematic surveillance of political views, or even of religious beliefs, especially among Muslim communities. In this self-perpetuating cycle, so-called counter-terror activity generates evidence of potential terrorism. So, for example, when MI5 tells their foreign counterparts that UK citizens are terrorists, and so they're interrogated, locked up in those countries, and even colludes in their kidnapping, and then helps the US government to prosecute them, such extreme cases extend the same perverse logic, thus reinforcing the original assumption that, that migrant or Muslim communities pose a threat of terrorism. This perverse logic was also formalized in the con Contest II strategy officially known as the National Security Strategy of the United Kingdom, Security in an Interdependent World, published in 2008. It called for a greater integration of various policies. This meant abandoning any distinction between domestic and foreign policy, any distinction between civilian and military resistance to oppressive regimes abroad. In practice, it meant that schools, youth clubs, and universities were meant to monitor the views of Muslim communities. For these surveillance and supposedly preventive measures, the strategy targeted a, a large group of nonviolent people who create an environment in which terrorists can operate. That's a quote from Charles Farr, Director General for Security and Counterterrorism at the Home Office in a speech he gave in 2009. Under this Contest II policy, this supposedly broad threat justified various non-prosecution executive actions. That's a bureaucratic euphemism for punishment without trial. Punishments supposedly aimed at restricting the scope for radicalization, even by groups not even advocating violence. These actions, executive actions, included revocation of UK citizenship and control orders. Similar punishment without trial include, control, include the asset freezing, travel bans, long interrogations at UK ports, which Sagir mentioned under Circle 7, detention periods without charge, and so on. These measures permanently stigmatize individuals, while also creating fear among entire communities. <coughs> now, blackmail, of course, is illegal. Nevertheless, it continues without any prospect of any redress in a court, much less a prosecution of the MI5 officials who carry out and, or authorize these illegal activities. At the same time, it's part of the overall counter-terror agenda. So if, in order to oppose the MI5 blackmail practices, we really need to challenge the basic assumptions that underlie those practices, the assumptions that turn entire populations into suspect communities. We need to oppose the entire so-called counter-terror agenda. That's much broader than what we can discuss this evening, where we have prepared a list of demands on the government 
Does everybody have a copy? No. If you don't have a copy, raise your hand. But if you've got the agenda paper, it's in the back. Yeah. It's double sided. So if you don't have it, raise your if hand. You don't, if you don't have. Can you put your hands up? You can put your hands up to the agenda paper. Put your hands up to the agenda paper. Let's go. 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 Yes, so, so must have been so I will conclude there, except to say that the rest of the meeting is to discuss how to act on the demand. That's me, that's my goal. Okay. Can you, can you take a better opportunity? Thank you. Thank you.